those really establish the foundation of what I consider to be all of the elements that create our ability to move as seamlessly as possible. Hormone that's made by bones that's released into the bloodstream and then goes to the brain and improves brain function. Andrew Huberman, a remarkable individual, has made an awe-inspiring discovery that has the potential to revolutionize our approach to getting fit. He shares his personal journey and the transformative effects that he experienced using Athletic Greens, a nutritional supplement. Then the third would be movement, right? And this has also been an enormous transition in the last, I think, just five years, which is not just for people interested in bodybuilding or powerlifting or for competitive athletes, but now it seems everybody including the elderly, understand that you need a combination of cardiovascular exercise and you need resistance training, whether or not it's with body weight or weights or machines, etc. But it goes far beyond just physical changes. It also profoundly impacts our psychological well-being. One of the key insights Huberman delves into is the concept of fuel utilization and the specific neurons that play a crucial role in our endurance and our performance. When we do certain forms of exercise, there's a hormone-like molecule that's released into the blood bloodstream called osteocalcin. Osteocalcin um, is known to provide support to neurons in a brain area called the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory. Um, the 150 to 180 minutes of zone two cardio per week will support overall brain health and function by way of improving blood flow. He introduces us to the idea of burning neural energy explaining how demanding mental tasks and sustained focus rely on glucose and epinephrine. By understanding this intricate process, we can optimize our efforts and achieve new mental and physical resilience heights. But it's very interesting that this muscle small, it's only 1% of the body's total musculature, can account for well over 15%, well over, it depends on the person, but at least 15% of your total energy expenditure during the day. That's insane. So if you're on a plane, like this thing of bouncing your knee or doing this thing again is actually a meaningful, it's not a replacement for exercise, but in terms of its metabolic impact is meaningful. Huberman dives into various forms of endurance training, such as muscular, long duration and resistance training. He enlightens us about the importance of building capillaries and mitochondria in our muscles. But what I find is every time I work out early in the day, I have more energy all day long. And I never know why that is. And it, it's because you start, to, most likely it's because you liberate a bunch of dopamine and adrenaline from your system. So you get a long arc of, of activation and alertness. Plus you are eliminating whatever adenosine is, is there. And so you feel like you have a lot of energy throughout the day. And how hydration is essential to all forms of exercise, including high intensity workouts. Furthermore, he generously shares techniques to regulate breathing during physical exertion, unveiling a carbon dioxide tolerance test in specific breathing patterns. This invaluable information empowers us to enhance our performance and push our boundaries. Very important paper published from the University of Houston this last year where they had people sitting for a couple of hours and every two or three seconds, they would keep their toe on the ground and they would do what was effectively a seated calf raise. Think okay. about the, the jumpy kid in class or when you've had too yeah, much yeah. coffee. Yep. Okay? They're doing it slowly and they're measuring the contraction of the soleus, mm -hmm. right? The longer, flatter muscle of the calf underneath the gastro. Yep. Turns out that muscle is very unique. It does not use the same fuel sources as other muscles in the same way. It's not so much a glycogen dependent muscle. It is designed, of course, to carry you very long distances or, you know, it's an endurance muscle. They had people do this while seated for a couple hours a day, and they looked at glucose uptake and they looked at overall insulin management. And there was a significant and meaningful improvement in insulin sensitivity. Hmm. Now, this is not about caloric burn. Yep. This is about essentially doing exercise while seated. Mm -hmm. Now. I put out some stuff about this on social media and people understandably laugh like, oh, that's ridiculous. First of all, they call it a soleus push-up in the study. You're like, that's a seated calf raise, but most people don't know what a seated calf raise yeah. is. So, you know, gym rats, you know, you're only laughing to yourselves. <laughs> I throw that myself in that. I mean, you know, it's true. Yeah. Most of the internet. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But what's very interesting is this is something that a lot of people can do who are trying to improve their metabolic status. Of course, they should also exercise, but 
As the paper describes, it's no surprise why this works. You know, were we quote unquote designed to walk around more or move more during the day? I don't know. I wasn't consulted the design phase, but <laughs> we were we were definitely moving around a lot more than we probably are now. Yeah. But it's very interesting that this muscle small, it's only 1% of the body's total musculature. Throughout the video, Huberman emphasizes the role of willpower in allocating resources and making decisions during challenging tasks. He enlightens us on the perils of muscle burnout, urging us to prioritize proper form and avoid injuries during repetitive exercises. We can attain sustainable progress and safeguard our well-being by taking these precautions. But the advantages don't stop there. Haberman explores the deep link between endurance training and how well our minds work. Now, in terms of exercise, exercise during the day increases the rates of glymphatic clearance at night. So the reason I mention this is that these are indirect effects on glymphatic clearance and blood flow. Now, what about direct effects? The direct effects bring us to osteocalcin. And the direct effects of exercise on brain function and health actually come from stimulation of the skeleton and load-bearing exercise. And this is something that I think is underappreciated. When we do cardiovascular work, again, you support blood flow, lymphatic clearance, but osteocalcin is made by the bones. Wow, hormone that's made by bones that's released into the bloodstream and then goes to the brain and improves brain function. And how does this work? Well, when the skeleton has load, load bearing, um, it is load bearing, then osteocalcin is released and it makes perfect sense. Why would the brain continue to support its own function if the body isn't being used? Well, let's say, how does the brain know that the body is being used? The body knows that, uh, the brain, excuse me, knows that the body is being used for load bearing work because osteocalcin is that signal. Again, the brain and body have to communicate and it's not like the body says, oh, I weight trained today or I did um, calisthenics today. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a hormone signal to communicate that to the brain. So this can be achieved a number of different ways. I actually think body weight exercises can be quite good. Um, there are a couple of online sources that, I mean, I think the incredible work that Ido Portal is doing, I-D-O Portal, he's big on this movement, he calls it movement culture, but this is, he's a, he's a phenom, but you know, not just doing push-ups and, and burpees and not that sort of thing, which are very linear, but a lot of non uh, dynamic, non-linear movement. He talks about explosiveness, suppleness. That you need both. I mean, not a week goes by without seeing an article in one of the major publications out there, standard media, let's call it traditional media. We'll be nice to them, <laughs> traditional media, that highlights some study showing that, you know, resistance training in elderly people can offset Alzheimer's or, you know, or that as our friend Peter Atia has pointed out so many times that many of the end of life creating injuries are due to people, older people stepping down the eccentric movements. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you need movement. That's the third category. Fourth, I will argue, and I like to think that maybe I've helped this movement, if you want to call it that, is light. In particular, mm -hmm. sunlight in the early part and throughout the middle of the day, and trying to minimize the amount of artificial light that you're exposed to in the evening and late night hours, most of the time, because you have to live life. Just fundamental. And then the last category that's important is social connection, aka relationships. Let's just call it relationships because that can include relationship to self. Mm -hmm. So those things set up the core foundation. And I think one way to think about them is just as a list. Another is to think about them in terms of a, of a schedule basis. And that's how I've really doubled down is I realize that every 24 hours, I need to invest something into each one of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, or even two years ago, I used to think, okay, like what's the workout split or how am I going to eat for the next couple of months? You know, what am I trying to optimize for? Is it muscle? Is it fat loss? Is it just maintaining? Is it energy? Is it focus? That's all fine and good, but sleep, nutrients, exercise, light relationships, those really establish the foundation of what I consider to be all of the elements that create our ability to move as seamlessly as possible between the states that we happen to be in and the states we desire to be in. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting because um, th there's this kind of, I feel comfortable talking about this, this sort of culture in academia where people are really, um, I know a lot of very smart people. I'm blessed to be surrounded by a, very, a, a lot of smart people in, in, inside and outside of academia. But generally, in the academics I know are really into endurance sports. 
They run, they swim, they play tennis. You know, it's rare that somebody goes to the gym with a specific interest in building muscle. That's not typically associated with um, the academic phenotype, although there are a few. I have, I have some colleagues that, um, one down at um, Baylor, who's an exceptional neuroscientist. He's really into, for instance, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think times are, are, are changing now. I think people realize that unless, at least what the science shows, that unless people get about five or six sets of reasonably hard work of resistance exercise per muscle group, that they're going to be losing muscle over the course of their lifespan.